Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me and your copy of Holy Scripture to the 11th chapter of the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 11, we'll be reading verses 1 through 10 this morning. Isaiah chapter 11, beginning with verse 1. A shoot shall come out from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt around his waist, and faithfulness the belt around his loins. The wolf shall live with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the kid. The calf and the lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young shall lie down together. And the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put its hand on the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. On that day, the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal to the peoples. The nations shall inquire of him, and his dwelling shall be glorious. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O oh God, may we hear what you would have us to hear. May we do, Lord, what you call us to do. May we be the people, the Advent people you call us to be. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Well, earlier this week, I came across an article from the Washington Post with these words comprising the first paragraph. It states the place these things take place, Bani Safan, Yemen. And these are the words in that first paragraph. The family of Osama Hassan faced a wrenching choice as his tiny body wasted away. Should they use the little money they had in a time of war to take the two-year-old to a hospital, or should they buy food to feed their other children? His family chose food. The article includes pictures of hopeless parents holding the skeletal bodies of their young children some just days before they died. There's a picture of an 18-year-old girl who I would have never known was 18 except for the caption under the picture. She looked to me like a woman in her second century of life. There were the haunting images of hospital beds with, with tiny twig-like legs sticking out of white sheets and a picture of stacked rocks on the scratched ground marking where the bodies of at least a dozen children were laying. Was there some sort of widespread disease that had, had spread through the area taking the lives of these children? No. No. Was there some drought that had struck the crops and the livestock so that food was scarce and the children couldn't eat? No. Were their parents just too lazy, unable to get work, or maybe too busy trying to make money to chase a dollar to feed the families that they overlooked at home? No. Then why are these children dying? Why are they literally starving to death? Why are there already tiny bodies wasting away to nothing but paper-thin skin, bones, and bloated bellies? It's one word. War. On Friday, November 18th, just a few weeks ago, in the Syrian city of Aleppo, nurses and medical staff rushed to evacuate patients from a local hospital, even grabbing babies out of incubators, some of them undernourished, and at least one of them still had the tubes attached to it. The hospital had been badly damaged. 
And those babies and other patients needed to be relocated in order to have some chance of survival and to keep themselves safe. What happened to the hospital? Was there an earthquake? No. A terrible storm? No. Had somebody careened off the road and ran into it with a truck causing the lights to go out and some of the walls to come? No, no. There had been an air raid on the city. And bombs were being dropped even on hospitals. What caused sick babies to be snatched from their incubators and already sick and suffering patients to flee from a hospital? One word. War. In the African country of Nigeria, at least 400,000 children are at risk of starvation. 2.6 million people have been driven from their homes and are displaced. And at least 6.3 million more are dealing with hunger and the potential for starvation. Has their economy crashed? Is there no food growing? No food coming in? No. For seven years now, that country has been under the oppression of the terrorist group Boko Haram. It's not a natural disaster, not an economic crisis driven by poor investments and greedy lenders. It's just one word, the same one, war. Of course, it's not just in faraway lands where the effects of war are felt. I remember living in Waco, Texas, a city with a VA hospital, a city where patients from that very same hospital would walk out the front door of that building and just keep right on walking, walking down the streets of Waco. They'd walk down the highways and along the service roads, along Interstate 35. I'd see some of them standing in medians of busy intersections, waving wildly at cars that passed by. I'd seen some of them digging through the trash cans at gas stations, sitting on the curbs of streets right off of an exit holding cardboard signs. I had a friend that worked in the park there who would tell me stories about large groups of them living together in hobo jungles in the park, in torn tents and half-rotted furniture. Once, they were young men and women with hopes and dreams of futures filled with families. But now, now their memories keep them up at night drive them to irrational behavior, force them to seek sanity in cheap glass bottles or tiny little pills that they trade with one another. What happened? Did they make bad decisions? Poor life choices, a, a, a rough upbringing? No. It's that same word again. War. It's not supposed to be like this, you know. It's not. The world isn't supposed to be like this. We humans were not created for conflict, for fighting, for war. Creation wasn't meant for this, and it shows. We've not only scarred each other, but we've scarred the very earth with our fighting. Why, there are even some places on this planet that are left uninhabitable, places where human beings cannot go because of our war. And the very thing that drives so many nations to fight is warping the weather patterns of our only planetary home in the universe in such a way that it frightens people. The world isn't supposed to be like this. I suppose, however, if there's to be any consolation, any slight solace to be found in the seemingly unending conflicts of our present age, of the news on the television, of the things in our paper, I guess, if there's any to be found, it's that such turmoil and war have, have not entered this world in the last few generations. It's nothing new. It seems to have been around as long as there were at least two people with varying ideas and an unwillingness to compromise. The effects of war we see today are just as prevalent in the ancient world, just as prevalent even in the times of the first prophet we called Isaiah, somewhere toward the end of the 8th century B.C. Isaiah had heard, or perhaps even witnessed firsthand, the devastation caused by the rising world power of the Assyrians, how they had conquered and ransacked the northern kingdom of Israel, how they were laying waste to nations all across the region, and how now, now they were turning their anger and their destruction and their aggression 
towards the southern kingdom of Judah. And Isaiah prophesied in the wake of King Uzziah's death that God's judgment was coming on Judah for the ways the nation was beginning to follow in the same paths of negligence, greed, and idolatry that had ensnared the northern kingdom. The prophet spoke of God's coming judgment, of how God, like some great divine lumberjack, would come and just level the place, cut trees down from the very root, he said, all the way down. And then yet, he foretold of a remnant that would survive, a small number who would live on to see a new day for God's people. It's in that spirit of optimism, for lack of a better word, that Isaiah speaks the poetic words we've heard this morning. But can I be honest with you? Really? The prophet's words, to me, they seem a bit, I don't know a better word, they seem crazy. Crazy. Did you read them? Did you read them? Did you hear me read? I mean, the prophet speaks about shoots growing out of dead stumps. New life coming out of a stump that's been cut and dead, about a coming king who will judge in, in this sort of biblical language of righteousness and faithfulness, but not by what he sees or hears, because you know only crazy people judge by those senses. The prophet, the prophet speaks about wolves lying down with lambs. I heard a, a rabbi say, oh, the wolf will lie down with the lamb, but the lamb won't get any sleep. <laughs> Leopards. Leopards taking naps with baby goats. Calves, lions, and fat baby sheep all snuggling together while a child plays around them, rounds them up like a shepherd. He talks about cows and bears grazing in the same field while their babies play together. He speaks of a coming day filled with vegetarian lions and poisonous snakes so timid that children can just play around their holes and not get worried. That's crazy. I mean, what is all that? What had the prophet eaten or inhaled or drank before he gave that prophecy? I mean, wolves don't lie down with lambs. They eat them. Just, if you don't know that, by the way, just, just find any copy of National Geographic. I'm sure you'll see some image of it in there. They eat them. Cows and bears don't graze in the same field. It's been known that bears like the taste of beef. And I don't know about you, but I'm not going to let coal even down on the ground if someone says, snake, snake. Doesn't make sense. Green shoots don't grow out of stumps. And hurting and destroying taking place, no hurting, no destroying taking place on the holy mountain. I'm sorry, I don't keep up with the news that well, but I, even I know, even I know there's hurting, killing, bombing, fighting, all sorts of conflicts happening on that same mountain today. And much of it is because there are so many people who call it holy. It all just seems crazy. The prophet doesn't know what he's talking about. It's impossible. It seems impossible to think that such peace, such tranquility could ever exist in this world. It seems impossible to stop people from, from bombing each other to death over disagreements about imaginary lines. A future where no child will go hungry on account of war, famine, greed, or even natural disasters. That seems impossible. A time when people will cease hating one another because of where they live or the color of their skin or which book they call holy or how much oil, money, or gold they have. It just seems impossible. To imagine a world where peace the sort of peace we hope for when we light the second candle of Advent, when that kind of peace reigns, and the thought of raising arms against another human being is recognized for the sin that it is, it just seems impossible. As if all of creation is turned upside down. Maybe it is. Maybe creation is turned upside down. Maybe that's the point of all of this. Maybe that's the point of this season and our need to wait, to hope, for peace. Maybe creation is upside down. Maybe this world is so messed up, so irreversibly and possibly soaked with sin, that to fix it is impossible. 
to put it back right is impossible. Maybe it is impossible for sheep, wolves, bears, cows, snakes, and children to all live together without so much as biting one another. Maybe it is impossible for hurting, destroying, fighting, and conflict to cease on God's holy mountain or anywhere in this world for that matter. Perhaps the peace we long for, the peace for which we've lit this candle today, perhaps such peace is really and truly impossible. Perhaps it is as impossible as a new green shoot sprouting from a cut dead stump. Maybe it's impossible, as impossible as a virgin who's nine months pregnant. Maybe it's impossible, as impossible as the creator of the universe, the one who set the stars on fire, being born to a teenage girl and her soon-to-be husband in some barn behind a motel. Maybe. Maybe it's as impossible as angels singing to shepherds and wise men following a star to worship a toddler they've never met. Maybe. Perhaps peace is as impossible as the death of God upon a cross or his resurrection three days later. Maybe. Maybe it is impossible. Maybe it is that impossible to turn creation right side up. And if it is, well... Thanks be to God, for a shoot will grow from a stump. A wolf will shack up with a lamb. A lion will eat hay from the bale. A baby will play with a snake. Violence will meet its end. And the babe of Bethlehem, the incarnate God, the crucified Christ, the resurrected Savior, the Prince of Peace will reign forever and ever. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's pray. Eternal God, creator of heaven and earth, savior of all humankind, Holy Spirit who called us ever on, Lord, we know that you call us in this season of Advent and every day of our lives to do the impossible, to love our neighbors as ourselves, to give from what we don't have, to bring peace in a world turned upside down. Lord, give us the strength to live into that calling, to turn the world right side up, to bring peace, let it begin with each one of us in our own relationships, our own interactions with others. For Lord, we know that peace is just a taste of your eternal love. So let there be peace, God. Help us to do the impossible, for it is only with you that we can to turn creation right side up to bring your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And speak to us now. Show us the ways that we are to do what you call us to do. And give us the courage and strength to respond. In the name of the Prince of Priests, we pray. We pray.